welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hello, this is James and welcome to episode 35 of the Madden America podcast. This week, Emily Shearer Cutler interviews attorney Tina Minkowitz. Today, we will be speaking with Tina Minkowitz, an attorney and survivor of psychiatry who represented the World Network of Users and Survivors of Psychiatry in the drafting and negotiation of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Tina is a strong proponent for the abolition of all forced psychiatric interventions and played a major role in attaining a shift in international law in favor of such a ban. She believes in the development of authentic user and survivor perspectives in human rights. Tina, thanks so much for joining us today. Could you tell us a bit about your background and what led you to your interest in international human rights law? Well, thank you very much for having me on this podcast series. So I am a survivor of forced psychiatric interventions myself, and my interest in law essentially stemmed from that experience in which law was an agent of the oppression and violence and discrimination that was that was perpetrated against me law was law was an agent of of disempowerment in my life and somehow both because of that and in spite of that i was drawn to law as the area that needed to be changed because law is an institution created by human beings and it can be changed equally by human beings. And when I was in law school, I became interested in international law in, for, for many reasons. It's, it's simply an area that's, that's interesting to me as a very fertile and, and interesting field where a number of of very foundational issues in human life and society are under discussion, issues of war and peace, for instance, in addition to human rights, issues of self-determination of peoples as well. And I was, I, I, I ended up being especially drawn to international human rights law and doing some work in a in a clinical program in that field and also becoming interested in disability rights law and i ended up starting to think about how to put those two fields together to address issues of psychiatric oppression to put together the legal framework and doctrine of disability non-discrimination together with um, international human rights. And that was, that was how I started to formulate some of the ideas that eventually came into the UN Convention. So I, I had also been in, involved in the survivor movement since 1978. So I was very much, I very much felt myself to be a part of a community that was advocating our rights and standing up for ourselves, telling our stories and and trying to agitate and campaign for the abolition of forced treatment. But there had not really been any strong legal theory that, that ended up being successful in moving us towards abolition. And what I came to believe was that disability non-discrimination together with an international human rights framework would allow for the, the kind of creativity that was needed to start to develop some concepts to understand things in a different way within a legal framework. And then I ended up having the opportunity to become involved with the drafting and negotiation of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which there was a process of for this convention that started 
within the year after I graduated from law school. So it was very good timing for me. And I know that you're a strong proponent of the abolition, not reform, of forced psychiatric treatment. Could you tell us more about the difference between those two positions and why you feel abolition is necessary? Sure. I think that really, historically, before the CRPD, every effort that was made in mental health law, sometimes there were efforts to to abolish forced treatment. But there always ended up being a perception by some people that, oh, you know, we can't get rid of it entirely. There's always going to be some exceptional circumstances. So we're going to regulate this practice. We're not going to allow psychiatrists to simply have a free hand. We're going to regulate them. We're going to require say, court hearings to review what the psychiatrists are doing. But we've got to, you know, it was just assumed that there was going to be a need for involuntary measures in some percentage of cases that were characterized as exceptional, and it was supposed to be a last resort. Now, we've seen that, in fact, anytime such provisions are enacted, anytime reforms are enacted in mental health legislation of that nature, it doesn't change very much. Sometimes if, you know, if you're going from a system that just kept people locked up with with absolutely no way to appeal to get out, people, people perceive that this is an advance, but sometimes it actually still results in, in increased levels of involuntary commitment, as appears to be the case in in a fairly recent reform in France that was undertaken. Okay, so we've seen that pretty much every place it happens. And similarly, the capacity standard, when we in New York State, not enacted because it wasn't legislative, but the New York State Court of Appeals decided a case in 1986 that brought in a capacity standard for the right to refuse treatment, even if you were locked up on involuntary commitment in a psychiatric institution, that they would have to demonstrate that you lack the capacity to make a decision about treatment. Now, when that, when that case came down, all of us in the movement thought, hey, this is great. Of course, we all have the capacity to make a decision. You know, we know our own minds. We know how bad the drugs are for us. We, we're perfectly capable of making that decision. Well, in fact, courts, are, courts interpret um, that standard. Courts apply that standard in a way that almost always gives the psychiatrist what they want. It, in, in New York, the, 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 you know, it, there's, New York may be worse than some other states. I understand in some parts of California, it's, it's, um, it's not quite as extreme. But in any case, what we find is that these kind of reforms really end up being almost a shell game. Reform of forced psychiatric treatment ends up leaving us with forced psychiatric treatment. Sometimes it ends up actually resulting in more forced psychiatric treatment, as is the case with a recent reform that was done in France in 2011. More, on a deeper level, when any of us are still subjected to the threat of forced treatment, it means that we're living in fear. It means that we can't develop our lives in freedom, that we're always living under this possibility of, you know, if I, if I really go through my distress and anguish all the way, they are going to come for me. You know, so in addition to the stress and distress you're already experiencing or the potential for what some people call spiritual emergence or transformation, you have to worry about being locked up and often you are locked up and then have to deal with that extreme trauma. 
So why should, I, I think really in a way the question to ask is why not abolition? And when you look at the justifications that are advanced for, for leaving any kind of any kind of potential for forced treatment in supposedly exceptional circumstances in supposedly as a last resort, what it really means is leaving the power in the hands of psychiatrists and in the hands of judges. And that still leaves people labeled with mental health conditions in a position of disempowerment, in a position of powerlessness, in a position of inequality and discrimination. And if we're supporting human rights, if we're promoting human rights and campaigning for human rights, that's the opposite of what we want. And abolition is the only way to actually get us to true equality and what, what many have framed as a truly inclusive society. Um, so what are some of the current barriers to the abolition of forced treatment, and why do you think the public is so reluctant to support abolition? Well, I think there's, there's many reasons. Surely the, the level of discrimination that is, is actually being fomented against people labeled with mental health conditions has really actually increased over time and some, it somewhat to a degree even being fostered by the mental health legislation that allows involuntary commitment. So when you have a group of people that is subjected to a particular unique and targeted form of social control, it's natural that the public is going to view that group of people as as warranting extreme measures of social control. That you have the danger to self or others standard prompts people to to view us as dangerous. Um, and and you clearly have a some some big media campaigns in the US and in many other countries that have been undertaken that that actually foment this kind of discrimination. And parenthetically, I'll point out that that's also, you know, that under the CRPD for states that have ratified it, there, there is actually an obligation of awareness raising to counter such discriminatory attitudes and prejudices. So I think discrimination is one big reason. I think another reason is that we've become so accustomed to a way of thinking that just assumes that there's going to be a need for involuntary measures to be done to people who are mad. And, you know, if you're mad, you go to the madhouse, you know, you're taken to the madhouse. And it's, it's really some very deep, discrimination that that persists in you know in the framework of of mental health legislation and the assumptions that this is a state of affairs that is inevitable and and can't really be changed or assumptions or beliefs that the only alternatives are between involuntary measures and doing nothing at all to support the person. Whereas in reality, there's quite a bit that's, that's being done, you know, as, as Madden America uh, readers know to, to promote and develop all kinds of a, a very wide range of support options that don't entail coercion and that reject coercion. So those are the, the, the main reasons. I, I think there's, there's some degree of resistance, but I think there's also a, a huge amount of simple ignorance or lack of awareness. The, the CRPD is, is not well known, even among users and survivors of psychiatry, and it's certainly not well known among the general public. To the extent that this this obligation of abolition 
um, is is enshrined in the CRPD and as interpreted by the the treaty monitoring body, um, there's there's just quite a lot of work that needs to be done to really inform people and explain what this means, because many people simply aren't aware of it. I would also say I don't interact that much with with these kind of discussions in the general public. Um, you know, I, I live in, in, in a rural community and, and I do my work on the computer. And, and this is my choice. It's the way I choose to live my life. I'm not as involved in community. And that's one of the options that, that I have as, as, as my human right to live the way I choose to live. But people who are engaging in some of these discussions with the general public have told me that sometimes there's actually quite a bit of support for us. For instance, that when they tell people that about the practice of electroshock or about the process of forced drugging with neuroleptics or giving people seven neuroleptics at a time, you know, or seven drugs of which five are neuroleptics, I, I, something like that, that there's quite a bit of this shock and, and there's, there can be quite a bit of support for us when people are presented with the opportunity to identify with us and to, to, to really get to know the, the tragedy and horror of what's done in the name of treatment. And I, I do know there is a lot of campaigning um, about those kinds of topics, electroshock, force drugging, and do you feel like um, that overall benefits us, or do you feel like that still ultimately is advocating for reform, for if we just end forced drugging, if we just end electroshock, it's still okay to put people on a 72-hour hold, for example? Yeah, I think that's a good question, because I do think that we have to always advocate. I think at this point, we really have to go for the whole thing. Um I would not want to see advocacy being done only to eliminate forced drugging without getting rid of, say, the 72-hour hold, because once they have you on a 72-hour hold and they have the potential to hold you longer, they can always say, you know what, unless you take this drug, you might not get out when you want to get out. We know that. That's the way it's already done. Yeah. So we have to we have to really look at everything. I know that sometimes there are initiatives that people are involved in already, say, for instance, getting rid of involuntary outpatient commitment. You know, yeah, sure, involuntary outpatient commitment is terrible, but if you campaign against that and you still, you don't say anything about getting rid of an involuntary inpatient commitment, I'm not really sure exactly how much you've accomplished. And I think that the CRPD really challenges us to take that next step and really campaign for abolition. With regard to the abolition of electroshock, I actually see that as even as coming from a slightly different angle because that's saying that there's a certain practice that's being done as, as called a treatment that simply shouldn't be done at all, that it's too harmful. I think we do need to look at those things. And at the same time, as a survivor of um, forced drugging with a neuroleptic, I often feel that to isolate electroshock in that sense can end up being, um, can end up drawing attention in a way that says, oh, this practice is terrible, but everything else is okay. So I'm not a survivor of electroshock, and I wouldn't want to impede people from arguing for a ban on that practice, but I also would want to caution that we need to question the entirety of these 
of these destructive, what Peter Bregan has called in his books, psychiatric treatments that are hazardous to the brain. I think electroshock damages the brain, yes, and so do neuroleptics. And if we can't or aren't willing to look at the fact that neuroleptics also cause brain damage, this kind of a problem. So I just think that there needs to be a wider conversation about treatments causing brain damage and, and that kind of harm. Kind of along that same line, I know that one of the most common questions that anti-force treatment advocates are asked is about what are the alternatives to force treatment? Oh, you believe in abolition, so what's the alternative? Um, so what is your opinion on the notion of alternatives to force treatment? Thank you for asking that, because I think that there are, there are two ways that I would really want to respond one is that you don't ask about alternatives when you're faced with a situation of violence that needs to be stopped. When there's a massacre in progress, you don't say, gee, what's the alternative? Um, you say, first stop, the, first stop the violence from happening. And that's what is really going on in, in the world of mental health services when we're talking about forced treatment. In a sense, even the term forced treatment, because it, it has the term treatment, can be, can be mystifying because it doesn't confront the violence of the situation. And that's, that's, one of the reasons why I was working to frame these, these interventions as torture. In fact, an, an early way that I was putting it is forced interventions in the name of treatment. So we need to stop the violence. We need to make it clear that putting drugs into a person's body that, that disrupt the person's brain function that disrupt the person's consciousness and sense of self is an extremely violent thing to do. Requiring the person to put the drugs into their own mouth is an extremely violent thing to do. And it's not violence as metaphor. It's not symbolic violence. It's physical violence. And that, that needs to be actually really deeply understood. So, that's what we're talking about as a first instance. We don't need or require alternatives to the current mental health system and the offerings of the current mental health system in order to demand an immediate stop to force treatment. What we need as an immediate change, okay, if we're stopping force treatment right this minute, we need to have society take on board the obligation of accommodating people in people in distress, people experiencing a great diversity of mental states. The obligation to accommodate people and to include people in society is very multifaceted. We're not going to do it perfectly. We're going to need to work on it. And societies are going to need to, to really undertake a greater, certainly for the United States, we're going to need to undertake a much greater commitment to solidarity and community than, than we generally have. I think that can certainly be a good thing for any society to do. Some societies have that um, sense of community much, much better than we do. And I'm sure there's great diversity within the United States from, from one community to another, from one place to another. It's a huge country and, and, a, and a very diverse country. So I think we need to learn from the places and communities that are a little bit better than others at fostering community and inclusivity. We also really do need to utilize and implement the alternative practices, both within 
mental health services and outside mental health services, alternative support practices outside any framework of mental health for those of us who really will say, you know, keep that away from me. It's not part of what I want, the same as many people would say about religion. I don't want religion. Okay, I don't want mental health. So we need, we need to utilize and implement the practices that exist now, which, as we know, have really been marginalized and shunted off to pilot projects, defunded, all that sort of thing. Imagine what it would look like if the mental health system, the, the whole mental health policy of a country would center practices that we now think of as alternatives, like soteria and respite and peer support, good quality types of peer support, um, and, and the various other kinds of practices, the, the hearing voices support, alternatives to suicide, these sorts of things that, that we know as, as small projects. What if that would be the center of a mental health policy? What would it look like? Okay, so that's the kind of thing for mental health policy and utilization of making available the opportunity to, to appoint and hire someone as a personal assistant for, for people um, dealing with distress or altered states of consciousness or, or unusual states of consciousness. There's quite a lot that can be done, even within our current understandings, that would just require a shift in policy, a shift in funding streams in order to implement. And to the extent that we still need more, those, you know, we need to keep working on it. Nothing is ever a finished project, and certainly the existing mental health system is not something that's particularly doing very well at meeting people's needs. So, you know, moving away from that and creating alternatives to it is, is certainly something that shouldn't be, that we shouldn't hesitate to do. You know, like I said, I think the, the question of coercion is actually separate from the, the notion of what types of services and supports are going to be offered. And it does need to be understood that that's, that's immediate and doesn't depend on, on whether there's, there's alternative kinds of support available. One important aspect of your work is that you've united the issue of forced psychiatric treatment with the broader disability rights community. Why do you think the disability rights framework is important for addressing this issue? Well, for me, the disability rights framework is simply a very accurate and correct fit to address an aspect of the oppression that we experience, an aspect of psychiatric oppression that really was dif is difficult or impossible to name without that framework. So the question why are we being subjected to such awful mistreatment? And why have we been throughout many centuries subjected to such mistreatment? I think we have to call it discrimination. And calling it disability-based discrimination is what makes the most sense to me. Because I do think to the extent that people are experiencing a kind of suffering or distress or unusual state of mind that, that kind of takes them out of ordinary life for a period of time or that, that they experience on a very ongoing basis, that they're just experiencing life in a very different way than other people. I think that it makes sense to understand that as being similar to the different ways of experiencing life that people may have because of cognitive differences or because of physical differences that sometimes 
get called impairments or simply, you know, th th there's always debate about how we're going to talk about this. So I, 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 I'm recalling the concept now neurodiversity or mental diversity. And we can talk about mental diversity, physical diversity. I think what we're talking about is a kind of difference that gets stigmatized and that's simply about a person's makeup, what they come into the world with or what their makeup may be even on a temporary basis. So for me, the issue of disability is not really about long-term or permanence. You know, things fluctuate. It's really about how much a particular diversity of mental experience or kind of distress related to your mental experience is impacting your life. How much is it impacting your life? And when it's substantially impacting your life, your relationships, your, you know, the way other people are seeing you and treating you, then it qualifies as a disability. And then we can start invoking our rights. We can start saying, okay, you know, I may be in intense distress, but that doesn't mean you have the right to come and put me in more distress by, by taking all my rights away, you know, or I may be really experiencing the world in a very different way than you. It's not causing me distress. So just leave me alone, you know, just kind of let's accommodate to each other rather than, um, rather than saying that my way of being is wrong. And then you can also talk about perceived disability. So when we are, um, when, when psychiatrists label any of us with a diagnosis or someone points to another person and says, oh, that person is mad, don't pay any attention to them, they're cuckoo, they're nuts, you know, that's perceived disability. I might not be experiencing any distress. I might, I, the way I see myself, I don't necessarily see myself as having an unusual state of mind. But if you're pointing at me and saying that about me, then you're treating me as a person with a disability. You're discriminating against me based on your perception of me in that way. And so that's how... I see us as being included correctly within the disability rights framework. I think it, one of the things that was important in bringing our issues to the disability rights framework was both to kind of explore how that framework as it exists is very appropriate to us and includes us and to, to kind of fill that in with content, what that means for us. How, how do we relate to reasonable accommodation? You know, is it so, how, how that still is, is very underdeveloped. But another part is to bring our issues to the disability rights framework to say, you know what? Self-determination, the right to self-determination is a disability rights issue equally as accessibility is the right to legal capacity, the right to not be forcibly treated, the right to not be locked up um, in, in psychiatric institutions. These are core disability rights issues because we are part of the, the overall constituency of people with disabilities and these are our issues, you know. The disability community is composed of many separate sectors. We have some things all in common, some things mostly in common, and some things not in common. You know, so there are there are issues that specific sectors need to deal with, and others and others don't. And we we created the convention by putting all of these things together. Um, so so that's something that I that I actually think is very important. So as a final question, how can people get involved with your campaign for the abolition of forced treatment? 
Well, there's a there's a website. Um, it's very simple to remember, absoluteprohibition.org, and you can go there and, and find out a little bit about what we're doing and how to get involved. If you're in the United States, um, let me know, and, and there's, there's some specific work going on that you might be interested in getting involved with, particularly in the U.S. as well. I'd also like to mention that I've been offering a, a, a course on the CRPD from a survivor of psychiatry perspective. Right now, it's a little bit in transition, and I am probably not going to accept any students for the current year, That unless you have already made yourself known to me. But it will continue. I expect it to continue in the future. And there's quite a lot that I have put online as resources that can be accessed by anybody, even if you aren't signed up to be in the course as, as a student. There's quite a lot that you can use for self-study, and that you can access at crpdcourse.org. Awesome. Tina, thank you so much for joining us today and for your work combating forced psychiatric treatment on an international scale. I am very grateful to have had the chance to speak with you and learn from you. Thank you for having me. Well, I just want to thank Emily and Tina for that interview. And also, if you're interested in some of the documents that Tina mentioned, you'll find links on the post that accompanies this interview on maddenamerica.com. So thank you for listening. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views, and updates.